influence. Um, if, in retrospect, I would say that my, my father um, um, had a kind of mantra uh, that he would repeat, and which uh, uh, you know, intermittently I would find irritating, but has nonetheless achieved its, uh, his result. I, I've never forgotten it. And, uh, and, it, and it was this, uh, son, um, whatever you get out of life, get understanding. And uh, and from mother and and from mother I um, I learned to uh, be irreverent and uh, spontaneous and um, and to seek pleasure um, um, and so father's kind of uh, meditative contemplative obsessiveness was balanced by um, mother's um, restlessness and. Uh, and, uh, and, and interest in diversion. And so those were kind of two constellations of factors that mom and dad communicated to me. Um, dad, dad's parents had been uh, academics and, um, uh, and had died uh, and left him an orphan, in fact. And he, he was quite, a, he was quite uh, preoccupied with, with my academic uh, career. I, w I would say that dad um, erred on the side of being too intimate uh, to in my face uh, as a child. And so I found separation extremely difficult, although not as difficult as it turns out he found it. Um, mother was much more, I think, balanced um, psychologically, and, uh, and, so, and so we were able to have a kind of intimate reciprocal relation at the same time she could let go and let me find my, find my way. My, my grandmother was uh, kind of uh, uh, completed the menage a trois there, and and she kind of adjudicated their disputes. Um, uh, she lived with us um, until her death in '62, and and um, from her I I I, uh, I learned um, um, what what feels like uh, um, uh, an exquisite sense of uh, of the momentary. Um, grand grandmother was uh, would uh, sit silently in her chair, and I can remember as a child on the floor. I must have been under five. And, and I would simply watch her, and she would point out the dust floating in the afternoon sun and how exquisite that pattern was. And so uh, grandmother was, um, was the inspiration for, I suppose, my interest in the phenomenological and the aesthetic. Um, so I worked hard. Dad didn't leave an option um, and did well in high school. Uh, uh, I, I went to conservatory. My mother had been a, a singer, uh, uh, and in uh, fact, she was called the, the Kate Smith of, <laughs> of the sort of lower Ohio Valley. And she and she had appeared on the Kate, Kate Smith. Kate Smith was um, an American singer, a popular singer who had uh, one of the first black and white uh, television shows. And mother was on it in '53. I can still remember um, the excitement in the house and and watching her. I must. I would have been six. Um, but I, uh, I, uh, my own interest in music was um, so it was kind of a mixture then of mom and dad in a sense. I took the alto saxophone, which is of course the, you know, smoky right jazz instrument, but I did it strictly classically and played only transposed flute sonatas and, and concertos, and uh, and had a scholarship to a small um, conservatory in Columbus, and decided that my life really wasn't fulfilled uh, spending twelve hours a day in a practice room with no windows and. And I had been um, intellectually engaged by the uh, freshman English professor, who, who, who for whom the center, or who had uh, uh, assigned to us uh, the Catcher in the Rye. It was the centerpiece of the spring curriculum, and so it was a kind of intellectual awakening for me, uh, having come of age in in this uh, in this politically low key family, and uh, and sort of uh, sort of cult strong cultural currents uh, in it. I mean, mother's interest in in music and nightlife and so on, but, but very, uh, I would say, uh, dormant. And uh, that seemed to awaken me, and I transferred to uh, another small college, and, but I didn't like it, it was too state, and then I went to Ohio State. And at Ohio, as an undergrad at Ohio State, the, I found the, the courses I took in, uh, in existentialism and, um, uh, and phenomenology the most uh, compelling, um, although the English department is where I Finally transferred after uh, initially being a history major, so but I, I would say the enduring interests remain. In fact, I'm reading now a, um, 
a study of a historian's uh, autobiographical experiments. Uh, and I'd read a couple of them, like George Moss, who, who's uh, well known in history of uh, masculinity and so on. And, um, it was the, the fourth year, though, that was pivotal for me. Um, I, I had transferred into teacher education, n not because I wanted uh, to be a teacher, I confess. Uh, I wanted to be a professor, but uh, it was the draft, uh, actually, to be truthful. And I, I'm, I, I think it's a little awkward to say that because people sort of like dismissed my interest out of hand after knowing that. But I think people enter professions for all kinds of quirky and even what appears to others be dishonest reasons, and yet then develop an authentic interest. But I, and, and, and for me, I think um, um, that it was a kind of flight path enabled me to keep a certain distance from it that I never, that, that, that um, served me well in the sense of being able to be critical and theoretical even when I was immersed in the first year of teaching high school English. But in that fourth year, um, I joined, um, I signed up for an experimental urban education program. It was 1969 and Don Bateman, whom I still have in touch with and arranged an 80th birthday party for a couple of years ago, Don Bateman, who's basically a, a linguist, although in his background he had studied with Robert Penn Warren at Minnesota and knew Southern letters. And, but when I, but he, his, his big research money was all in, in transformational grammar. But he had been radicalized like so many people by, by the 60s. And when I met him, he, he was clutching a book that had just appeared in English, and it was uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And so that became the key text, uh, as it has been for so many, for you as well, then by your response. And um, um, in that seminar, then, we grappled with those ideas and, and, uh, and went into Columbus's um, uh, inner city to, to work with, um, uh, in tutorial relation with, uh, with struggling students. And uh, it was really my first. I, I grew up in a suburb of Columbus um, that was uh, absolutely all white, absolutely all white. So as critical as I have been and continue to be of, of, of racism in the South and, and the segregation of especially private life, public life has been forcibly <laughs> integrated in the South. Um, but I've, oh, I've felt even more keen contempt uh, for the segregation in the North of the United States, in part because of the, the self-righteousness of many, many Northerners. Um, and so I, I actually um, can't ever remember having met an African-American uh, until this program and found myself then in the midst of poverty. And, and, um, but very much with a, a kind of naive uh, sort of, um, uh, I, I can make a difference uh, and uh, um, uh, sort of taken for grantedness about my own racialization and uh, simply it wasn't actually even confronted at that stage, I would say. And then in the spring, I did my student teaching in an inner city, um, all black, um, junior high school. And, and, uh, and, and uh, to, to f not the further documentation is necessary, but I ended up teaching Soul on Ice, which shows how naive I could be. To a, 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 and my, my mentor teacher was this uh, um, white West Virginian woman, and she just would bleached white when we were discussing uh, Cleaver's notion of rape as political action. And, uh, and the eighth graders were quite uh, beside themselves. They, you know, suddenly they weren't diagramming sentences there, <laughs> uh, talking about um, Cleaver's idea of the menial. Um, and and uh, even though that w went well, <laughs> that is, they, they, they played along with me, and uh, I managed to get through student teaching, uh, mainly because this Don Bateman um, had such clout. And, and so even though I think the, the local officials in the school were kind of horrified at what I was up to. They nonetheless let, let it happen and, and approved. But I, but, I, but I did have a dim sense that I was uh, out of my element and that I, that I really didn't know what I was doing and, uh, and maybe I should do something else. And so um, I, I took a job uh, in, an, in an elite public um, high school uh, outside New York City, um, um, which was... Uh, um, a, a profoundly imprinting experience. In, in that, um, it, it was really, I would say, where my own class trajectory uh, was heading. That, that is, if, if we had been successful and re reclaimed the church pew wealth, uh, we would have the kind of money to live in a place like that and send, and send my kids to a school like that. I, it was a nine-period day. 
I taught four classes, never more than 15 students. It was an elective student, uh, elective system, and so I was. Uh, we had to, of course, teach Hawthorne and Shakespeare, and uh, but uh, but I was also able to teach a course on existentialism and uh, and even run an encounter group, uh, which is which had been an interest of mine in grad school, and I had continued, not the Esalen ver version, excuse me, but the NTL National Training Labs, and then I'd done some Tavistock work. Um, and what, what I had to confront um, at Schreiber High School was that, um, that even the, uh, the faculty, I thought, were in general uh, superb. Uh, and so the, the, the quality of instruction was, was uh, in, in general uh, as, as excellent as I could imagine at that time. And the curriculum was uh, strong. And even though 98% of these kids went on to college, some 30% went to the Ivies, it, it was a disaster. Um, it, partly it was a historical moment, of course. It was 1969, and, and the disaffection was uh, palpable. Um, but the question of meaning um, seemed to, to hang over the, 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 the high school like a, like a hard, large shadow. And so even though these kids had it all in the sense that this Midwestern middle-class kid had imagined having it all might be, they even had the intellectual resources that, that I had worked so hard to obtain, and they, and they had the critique of society. Um, they were articulate, they were everything I had struggled to be, and they were that already, and it was very insufficient. And so that, that, that left me with this problem of, um, of secondary school education as a problem of meaning. Uh, and so I, so I never really fastened my attention to the sort of technical issues of you know, lesson plans and so on. I mean, we didn't have to do lesson plans uh, ever. Uh, I never had to tell people what I was doing. They, they, we had a department office, and, and my uh, deskmate, uh, Olga Dufour, who had a PhD in English from Wesleyan, would ask me what I was doing and what I thought of that. But uh, there was never that kind of bureaucratic s surveillance of, of what I was doing. And, um, and so I was able to focus on the, the kind of um, uh, uh, the affect of the, of the place and uh, got to know some students quite well um, and personally. Um, and it was, it was that experience that, um, that left me thinking I wanted to study um, education as, a, as an academic field. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd taken a course with Dwayne Hubner at, at Teachers College uh, one semester, and uh, at, at the advice of Paul Clore, whom I met um, um, in summer of 1970, uh, Don Bateman had uh, wanted to hold on to me. Uh, we we'd liked each other. And, uh, and so he had, uh, that summer after I graduated with the bachelor's, uh, that was June 69, he put me right into the master's program. And that summer I took courses before I went to New York. And, uh, and, and got to meet Paul Clore, who, who really is my mentor. His photograph, uh, going downstairs, you'll see my arm around a, an old guy. That's, uh, that's Paul at Bergamo in 1995. And the other fellow was Patrick Slattery. I don't know if you know Patrick. But, um, and so Paul had said, but whatever you do, take a course with Dwayne Hubner. And, and so I did, and I was uh, fascinated uh, and engaged and, uh, and had initially thought I would go to TC, um, um, but, uh, but decided uh, that I'd return to Columbus and, and finish with my, my, my mentors. And, uh, and I did that. Um, so that, that's sort of the, the, the early phase. Uh, qualitative research. Uh, has always seemed to me um, an umbrella term. Um, uh, it's uh, an inclusive term, uh, and and so it's lacked a certain coherence. It, uh, the coherence it's achieved seems to me to be negative in the sense that it's not quantitative. Um, but it is a term of convenience and uh, and a useful term. Um, I wrote a piece with qualitative uh, in, in the title a long, uh, a long time ago, uh, published it in 79, uh, called The Whole Bright Deep with Understanding. And, um, and for me, the, the, the aspiration of the qualitative researcher is to capture the immediacy uh, and vividness of, of, that, uh, of that dust hanging in the afternoon air that, that, my, that my grandmother pointed out to me, and, and enabling the, the reader to, to also uh, uh, also to see that pattern, and perhaps then to notice the uh, um, what's here, <laughs> uh, 
uh, in, in, in his or her own situation, what, what, what presents itself, not, not just the, the, the aesthetic in a sense of, a, uh, of noticing the externals, but the, the, the also the, the, the meaning of, of one's own, own situation. And so it, it, uh, it encompasses both this project of understanding, uh, which, which is uh, uh, by no means r rationalistic, although it certainly is intellectual, but is, it is also multidisciplinary, I suppose, and, and an aesthetic in a profound sense, um, and political, and, uh, and, and really the, the various disciplines that comprise the humanities and the arts I all make their, can make their cont contribution to um, to providing a kind of grammar of, uh, that, that the, the researcher can use to, to try to understand a particular, particular um, problem or moment. And, and um, I became interested in autobiography after, um, uh, after I graduated um, um, in 72 from Ohio State. The, the dissertation was really focused on th this kind of um, shocking problem for me at Schreiber uh, that, that, that they could they, 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 they could be so educated <laughs> and uh, and be so unhappy and um, I didn't I didn't focus because in part I think I, I was too immersed in the historical moment to gain uh, any distance from from it but I did I, I focused instead on um, uh, on the way that the school seemed to me specifically contributed to to the uh, to the estrangement um, and um, and and its effect on on the subjective formation of the students, the w and in particular the way that it, that it split off um, um, the the official curriculum, if you will, from their own um, their own sort of quote private and subjective meaning uh, preoccupations, and and so that they there was this kind of divide rather than seeing the curriculum as an opportunity for them, in fact, to understand their own um, situation. Uh, the curriculum became this kind of uh, elaborate um, uh, distraction from, from it, and so I, uh, I, uh, I uh, the, the, the main part of the dissertation was what, what was later published, as *Sanity Madness* in the school. It was these these twelve ways in which schools drive children mad, and and then at the end, I, I tried to imagine what kind of a curricular organization might, in fact, support some. Um, bridging of this divide between the curriculum and subjective formation and how it might be organized and in particular I have focused on um, the, um, uh, the importance of solitude uh, and solitary study uh, as, a, as, a, as a one means of, uh, of the students struggling to um, find language for what might seem stri strictly private um, and particularly academic language, um, and then and then a, a, a group experience, some kind of a dialogical encounter that that Fury had spoken of, and and then and that I had experienced in the Tavistock and the NTL. That is the way that really open, honest uh, co confrontation, and sometimes, but also uh, self self uh, sort of confessions and uh, authentic speech, uh, the effort at authentic speech. Yeah, how that can be re revelatory. Um, and, and that the, so that the group itself also then could be a kind of uh, co contrapuntal, but not contrapuntal, but well, contrapuntal to the solitary study. And so I, that, that's how the dissertation ended. And um, after I took the, the job at Rochester, in a, um, I focused uh, on the subjective formation. It, it wasn't clear to me initially. I, I even have an essay from that period called Search for Method. And, um, and I came upon the, the, uh, the Latin infinitive uh, for curriculum uh, and seized upon it as a kind of you know, iconic symbol for what I was ser thought I was searching for, that is the site of the curriculum as simultaneously academic and subjective. And, uh, and then um, tried to, um, to devise a method by which one could um, um, Systematic, I, I, I put that in quote, quotation marks, uh, study uh, that, that site. And that was the regressive progressive analytic synthetic method. And, and that, that's, it's a hodgepodge, speaking of umbrella, umbrellas. Um, um, uh, the, the regression owes um, 
the notion of regression is, is pretty much in the psychoanalytic tradition and, uh, and, and, and derived from my reading in, in, in psychoanalysis, and, uh, which had been fairly, in, um, I would say, superficial at that stage. Um, and in abnormal psychology and in, in the Tavistock work especially, which was about peeling back layers. And, um, and in the regression, the idea um, was to, to try to return, not, not to remember from the point of view of sitting here today, but to try to return and, and enlarge the, the pool of memory, that is to try to re-experience. And the, the device I employed for that was to focus on sensory elements, like the dust in the air. Uh, the, the, the pigtails and the girl who sat in front of you, to, to try to remember what it felt like in that room. Um, in, the, in the progressive, uh, I, I added that, um, really uh, in deference to Sartre, who, who really is one of the major influences in, in my life, uh, the, the early Sartre, b before the Marxist conversion. Um, and uh, in, in his, uh, um, in Being and Nothingness, there's a section on existential psychoanalysis in which he He's damningly dismissive of, of, of Freud's, um, what he sees as Freud's submergence in the past. And he insists, I think somewhat, um, uh, somewhat ill-temperedly, that it's really the future that divines us and that the, uh, that the, the poursuit, the, 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 the design, which is his notion really for Heidegger's Dasein, I mean, the incompleteness and indeterminacy of of, sub, of subjectivity is an opening into, uh, onto the future, and and the, and it's and it's uh, and it's contemplation of the future that the that the progressive moment then invites. What, what fantasies and, and 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 it could take many forms. As a teacher, uh, intellectually, uh, I've always supposed that those fantasies really are about the present. That the that it's really a kind of uh, a device to try to. Uh, to, to disclose elements of the present, but by thinking about the future. Um, and then the, the analytic moment comes later, and, and at first I thought I would employ a, a, an already extant um, theoretical grid to, to enable us to try to think about what we'd... But, I, I, but I, I, I concluded quickly that it was really better, even though it, it meant that it was more clumsy and it could go in, 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 in innumerable directions, but to leave it really open to the student to decide how to... So wh whatever sort of sense you wanted to make of it, it, the point of the analytic isn't to try to superimpose a grid, but rather to see what kind of narrative coherence can be made toward um, a re-synthesizing of, of the subject in, 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 in the public space. So, you know, after you've sort of... Uh, um, dismembered yourself and, and hopefully re-experienced uh, uh, aspects of your past, some, some of which you may have wanted to forget, and then um, uh, reimagined the future and, and, and then narrativized what, what, you, what you've discovered. Then you pull yourself together and, 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 and go into the classroom, as it were, and operate from presumably a, a much more complex and profound reservoir of, of subjective possibilities. Um, by means of which you can engage students' responses. Um, so that, that's the autobiographical method, and, um, and uh, Sartre and Freud um, were obvious, uh, obvious influences. And, uh, Virginia Woolf has um, been a great influence for me. She, she shows up all the time. Holbright Deep with Understanding is, uh, is her line. Um, um, I, I suppose it's the grandmother influence. Uh, she, she, she captures the moment. She doesn't capture it, she, she uh, presents it so that we can share it uh, with her. Uh, and for me, this uh, is never separate from my experience of my grandmother, I suppose, but I think it's broader than that. It's, uh, it's really uh, being alive, which, as you know, is so fleeting, um, and uh, especially when we're caught up in, in, in work life and, and, and our love life and the, all the aspects of our lives, that there's a kind of submergence in the moment, which, well, um, it's, impa it's impassioned perhaps, but, it's, uh, but it also, uh, in some strange fashion, also sort of uh, obscures it. Uh, and, um, and so it's this uh, sense of vividness and immediacy that, that Maxine Green talks about uh, so beautifully that I think was always been the source of my 
uh, attraction to Virginia Woolf's fiction, although I, I, th I th think it's the beauty of the fiction as well, her, her, the elegance of her, of her language and, uh, and, and the care with which she chooses words. And, 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 and for me, it's a very um, powerful and moving um, uh, and idiosyncratic um, poetic prose. Uh, and it's just a, it's an enormous achievement and I suppose I, I've always been also attracted uh, to her life um, and certainly my early life I, I think I struggled with uh, um, uh, what was real and what wasn't and uh, and certainly worried about madness and uh, and um, my, my early years were, uh, were were psychologically very difficult, and uh, so I, that was no doubt a kind of um, um, source of my fascination with her. But I, I read uh, her work over and uh, over again in my, especially in my twenties. Uh, hard for me to say um, because um, she was a woman of little words, a few words, and um, and she was. Uh, I experienced her as. Uh, um, so loyal to me that even the the sort of objectification that's inevitable in description would seem to her in some way a betrayal, or so that's my fantasy. Um, so I, I, I'm sure what she would say. We 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 occupied, of course, very different moments. Um, she was born in 1882, and uh, and she would no doubt find. Uh, aspects of my life very strange. Uh, on the other hand, I think she's quite capable of seeing below the surface and uh, and to see the continuity. I'm very much, uh, very much her her uh, grandchild, and I'm surrounded by her objects. <laughs> I, I think about her uh, nearly every day. Um, so it, I think the solitude uh, and 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 solitude as apprehension. Um, and as the as the um, as the moment for um, self encounter and and conversation with one's self, uh, uh, solitude is a very con kind of complex and um, I, I hate to use the word pregnant, but because uh, it's not just one thing that's being born, but uh, nor is it inevitable either. But it's this it's this side of possibility. That I think is uh, obscured when when one uh, flees to the radio or the self. I mean, uh, to force to, to to force to encounter oneself in silence uh, is uh, I th is in at least a U.S. culture pretty pretty rare and uh, and in in the school <laughs> doesn't tend to happen. So um, but yeah, I would all of those series of ideas are associated with. Um, with grandmother, grandmother Brooke, I didn't know, um, and I, uh, what was wrong with me? Um, I, I, I experience it even now, as uh, as being overloaded with uh, parental projections, um, and a lot of um, with with a with a an, almost an ocean of subterranean. Currents that were not articulated in our family, but but which all three of us uh, internalized, and so it was a, a very complex morass of of stuff, um, and and uh, so I can speak about it in terms of of, of self differentiation, of differentiating myself from the family, but that's the you know the the cover story. I mean that's the headline. It doesn't say all the back pages. So certainly there was that. I mean. I was, I was tr trying to separate myself from my father in some sense, um, because my father had been, uh, who had been orphaned, and and uh, and when I would protest as a teenager, Dad, you you know you need to get off my back. I mean, I, I, I'm 16 years old. I need to. Have. He would come to my bed every night and sit on the bed, and I would narrate the day's events. I mean, in retrospect, I would say it's uh, it was a strange, is an unnatural intimacy. And I think there were deep homoerotic elements in it. Uh, um, at the same time, um, I knew I had a father, uh, and so, and I wasn't alone, and uh, and I trusted him deeply, and uh, so it was it was a great gift. I, I don't I don't mean to just to complain about it, but it did leave me. 
in a, some kind of sort of truncated <laughs> state as a young adult, not really clear about what I was, what I was uh, not at all clear about what I was doing. And I had this, uh, th this enormous um, sense of, of, uh, of, of suffering and unhappiness. And uh, so it was a daily struggle to get through the day. And the years of therapy have helped me clarify it and, uh, um, and, uh, and time. And it ended by sort of, uh, by the, the time I connected with Dina um, and, um, and we had uh, Gabriel. Uh, things things um, clarified then, and uh, and I and for a time I was happy. We were happy together. Uh, it didn't last long though, and um, uh, Dina was important in my life in many ways. Um, and one of the ways uh, was that um, she confronted me uh, as a man. Uh, she was a feminist uh, woman, and. Uh, and she uh, is, a, uh, was, is a psychotherapist and actually has a, a, a modest reputation in the Bay Area uh, for as a woman psychotherapist. And um, that was an extraordinarily uh, painful and uh, an unpleasant <laughs> experience. Um, and when she fought, she knew right where to put the zingers. Uh, years of therapy help you do that. So it was uh, excruciating and finally intolerable for me. And, uh, and um, and when I left that relationship, although we went back after the baby was born, we actually split in a sort of the sixth or seventh month, and then went back. Um, and I've and and I fought uh, after the after that we split up. I was able to stay in it, even though for a time things were pretty rough. She was she wasn't altogether happy being a single mother, as you might imagine. And uh, but I was able to stay in it then um, because I I could flee. Um, and th that was, she was always right about that, uh, the, uh, although I don't think it's, it is my singular fate, but it's also very much a man's fate that when, when the going gets rough, we get going. And, uh, and so having that, that separation was very uh, helpful and, and able to stay. And so she and I have uh, stayed, and we're, 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 we're close today, I would say. We, we don't talk often, but when we do, it's an intimate and loving conversation. But when I left, uh, um, Dina, I was clear that being a, a straight guy was a, was a problem. It's, it's a problem. It was, and it was a particular problem politically um, um, because, um, and, and what made it so, so sort of reverberating was the realization that this is what had happened between mom and dad, that, that mother had died miserable uh, and dad had insisted that she give up her career uh, and stay home with the children. And this uh, crushed her. She wanted to do it. Uh, she believed it was the right thing to do, but it was the wrong thing to do. And it crushed her and, uh, and destroyed her. And, and so the, the intimate enemy idea, right? So it, it, it left me very distrustful. Uh, I, it, it, and, and, and by that stage, I felt I had a, an option. I felt I, I had a possibility. It, it wasn't it wasn't um, going to be easy, and I did find uh, sleeping with men difficult initially. It was not necessarily pleasurable, awkward, uh, not knowing what to do. And uh, I never felt um, comfortable in gay bars. I didn't understand the culture of gayness, and, I, and I've never been able, I never have shared the, the coming out experience in the sense that, oh my God, I'm gay. Uh, I, I've never had that moment. Um, I, I feel like I've always been gay. I've always had that potential, but, but I grew up straight and, I, and my first sexual fantasies were about women, about girls' breasts, and, uh, and I wanted to sleep with girls and I was fairly determined to do that, and I did. Um, so my, my, init my initial formation was, was exclusively heterosexual. And it was this kind of political, psychological critique, plus the self-work I think I did, that enabled me to make this shift, which I didn't do all at once. There has been plenty of backsliding uh, and, 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 and affairs with women after I publicly declared myself as gay. I, I, I decided to, to, to do that for the political reason and uh, wrote my father and, uh, and came out. Um, but privately I would uh, I have these backsliding moments. Um, being gay is um, 
sometimes felt like a big mistake in my life. Um, um, because um, it didn't solve, and it avoided a certain problem of being an intimate enemy, uh, but it didn't solve a lot for me um, emotionally. Um, and it's continued to be work, although I, God knows I certainly found out how to enjoy the sex. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm certainly an enthusiast of, of gay sex. I'm enthusiast of straight sex and and uh, many points in between. But um, what what being gay for me, uh, the what I'm grateful uh, about being gay is that it it um, positioned me as an outsider um, and um, and gave me a, a series of points of, of view not only of society, but, but of my own formation. Uh, and so this notion of the queer is a kind of useful um, point of, uh, of, um, of, of contemplation. Um, so certainly I, I, uh, I, I, uh, I'm committed to, to, to uh, civil rights. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I talk like this, I worry that it can sound um, like somebody who hasn't come to grips with his homosexuality or in some way a disidentifying move. And so I, I feel compelled to say that, um, um, that I am committed to civil rights for, for gay men and lesbian women. And, uh, and I am gay. I, I declare that uh, identity. At the same time, I, my own, I think the achievement of that identity was a kind of complicated um, consequence of, of, of a broader autobiographical process rather than as a kind of thematic plot line in the, I mean it is a thematic plot line, but it didn't, it didn't alter the autobiography. Oh, you, the, you see the study idea, right, uh, in there. I, you know, I came across this, um, Paul Clore gave me that issue of Teacher's College Record. It's December 1971. If he didn't give it to me, he told me to buy it. Um, it's an extraordinary issue, and and I liked the McClintic piece, and uh, I cited in Understanding Curriculum. I've cited a number of places, but this year I I I, um, um, I, I, um, I allowed myself to to dwell on it because of the appearance of this group, Curriculum and Pedagogy, um, and it's. Um, it's kind of what Bergamo used to be. It has, I mean, it has the excitement attached to it, and a sense of things are happening, and and the um, and the old sort of political perspective of uh, that used to be associated with Apple and Giroux, but uh, really became discredited in many ways due to due, due to them. And um, so it ha it ha and yet I felt there was something terribly wrong about the the conjunction, and so the the, the piece. Is a, is an exploration of that, and uh, and as you know, it's it's uh, it's critical of the conjunctive relationship for, for both political and intellectual reasons that that it's left us, at least in the U.S., uh, scrambling to figure out ways to teach stuff that kids don't want to learn, without ever us grappling with the fact that that we should have some determination over what it is, in fact, we're teaching, and that intellectual freedom is an absolute prerequisite to to teaching, to, to, to practicing our, 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 our vocation, our profession. Um, and I, um, and it appeared this summer in the, in the Journal of Curriculum and Pedagogy, their open-minded group. Um, there are other aspects of the piece that are appealing. I mean, he, he, he writes it at the end of the 60s and, uh, you know, there's the references to cyberspace and I suppose these are really details that if somebody were interested in it could either read my piece or better yet read read his. Um, I don't know, it's, I haven't done that yet. I'd like to find out what's happened to McClintock. I mentioned in the piece that this Eros in education that he says he was going to write, at least it doesn't show up anywhere I, you know, Amazon or the Harvard Library. Um, I, don't, I don't know what he's, if he's even this right. Um, well, the Marxists have gone after me all along. Um, so that autobiography was a, a bourgeois narcissism, um, and um, um, 
there have been a, a different set of critics, um, although there's some intersection, that have insisted that my uh, devotion to to theory is uh, lacks a, p a political element and is not activist enough, and um, and so um, those are, those have been constant refrains, and I I I I, um, I deliberately. Um, uh, responded to them, or explicitly responded to them in what is Crickin theory. Um, uh, for many years I, I, I kind of was insulted by these charges. Th they, they seemed to me to be superficial and, and wrong, of course. And um, so in, in understanding curriculum, I used the autobiographical method to, uh, as a way to understand the present political subjugation of teachers and education professors in the United States. and, and, and uh, which I understand as versions of displaced and deferred misogyny and racism, which I then locate in the, the gender politics of the Cold War and the racial politics of desegregation and the civil rights movement, then, which uh, in the public's imaginary seems to um, uh, be indelibly um, associated with the public school, understandably with desegregation, of course. Uh, um, but the um, but the uh, the political exploitation of the Sputnik event um, as a failure of public education rather than of Eisenhower military policy, and how that's continued to the to the present day, um, so that the, the 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 genius of the of the Bush administration is this uh, this allegation that the, that the, that poverty represents underachievement, which is a a consequence of teachers' ineptitude, which ha is a consequence of education professors misleading them and giving them progressive poly uh, nonsense, and uh, and that teachers are responsible for for learning, which I go after in the curriculum and pedagogy. I mean, the the problem with curriculum and pedagogy piece. Um, um, those, th th that that I think has been, in general, the criticism. I, I've I've always taken it uh, more seriously than. Than I've allowed people to know. Um, um, what am I working on now? Was that the the next one? Well, I, I just finished two two projects um, uh, that'll appear next year. One is um, um, uh, uh, the synoptic text and other essays, curriculum development after the reconceptualization, in which I. The the the, the uh, problem of curriculum and pedagogy is in there. It's recent essays, and um, what what I'm suggesting is um, um, that some number of us who were who who were interested might write textbooks um, uh, for teachers that summarize recent research in the school subjects and especially in interdisciplinary areas in ways that link that. That, that demonstrate the relation of that academic knowledge to the possible relation of it to self subjective formation and social critique. Um, and um, that's what I tried to do in the gender of uh, racial politics and violence in America, uh, my study of, 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 of lynching and, and interracial prison rape. And it's also then what I did with uh, the second of the book projects that will appear next year, which is entitled The, the Body of the Father and the, and the Race of the Son, um, Noah Schraber, and the, the Curse of the Covenant. And what I'm after there, uh, as you know, the, the, um, the Curse of Ham is the kind of biblical injunction for racial hierarchy generally and, and enslavement particularly, but I was also then invoked by segregationists. and. Uh, and so I, mean, I, I study that episode in some detail, and, and the biblical, the, the exe, exegesis of it. And I'm interested in, in what, it, what, what seems to me to be at stake, which is um, um, uh, the homoerotic relationship between the father and son, which gets disavowed uh, uh, and specularized. Um, uh, and uh, made into a kind of, uh, uh, and othered, uh, and made into a kind of hierarchy. And, uh, and, and, and uh, sort of kind of puntled to Noah is Schreber, the, 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 the German, 19th century German judge, uh, who, uh, whose breakdown he, uh, he was able actually to, to, to record in his 1902 memoirs, which Freud then used as the basis of his theory of paranoia. But Schreber uh, experiences God as uh, raping him, 
and initially, uh, but he succumbs. And so here's this patriarchal German judge who turns to cross-dressing to make himself pretty for God the Father. Who, So the, 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 those enable me then to, to try to um, do an exegesis of whiteness. And, uh, but I do it in the form of this synoptic textbook in the sense of reporting to teachers and others research on these subjects that, that are juxtaposed in a fashion that I'm hoping will create ruptures in their own taken-for-granted assumptions of whiteness. Um, I'm going to do a sequel to Understanding Curriculum. Um, that's the project, um, the, the big book project I'm on now. And I want to focus on sort of 95 on and to try to, th uh, to provide some detailed portrait of what, what the field has been doing um, since then. Um, um, and part of what the field's been doing is, the U.S. field, uh, is, and the Canadian field's been doing it for a long time, is the interest in internationalization. And for, uh, I have this scheme if you will, for internet to study internationalization that that I'm that I propose to UBC and which UBC has taken an interest in. We'll see if the fu funding is forthcoming, but it's to provide opportunities for nationally or regionally distinctive um, fields of curriculum studies to study historically their own intellectual formation and subjective formation, and uh, and uh, be uh, commissioned to to uh, to uh, theorize critiques of their their present situation. Um, and uh, uh, present these in Vancouver uh, at a conference with consultants and a local local audience, uh, consultants from the, around the world, as a kind of moment of the, the local meets the global. What I'm interested in is if, if we can use globalization not simply as an erasure of the indigenous and the local and the specific, but rather an opportunity to become more fully conscious of it and uh, and um, and then uh, and and that really is lifted from the method of career I mean that's the regressive progressive analytic synthetic on a, on a kind of more collective scale um, but I'm inviting the participants the scholar participants to critique the very concepts that I'm using otherwise we have a reinscription of colonialism and imperialism so so I want to see it, I want to start a conversation and, and this is my this is my scheme, if you will, but I, it's quite expendable scheme because it is located in my own autobiography and my own set of intellectual uh, theoretical commitments. Um, and so I, 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 I suppose the through lines have to do with um, with this uh, um, concern about. Um, um, the curriculum, the school curriculum, lacking uh, connections to, to students' subjectivity and to teacher subjectivity and and to society. How to, how to make uh, how to offer sort of uh, opportunities for 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 students and teachers to think about how to do that on their own, not to do that for them, of course. And so the, the, that's the kind of through line. And then I'm and then the international is on a different sort of setting, scale of that, but. And also, I'm interested in, in, in other cultural critiques of that idea. I mean, it is very much rooted in the U.S., and it's very much rooted in a particular uh, uh, set of decades that I've undergone. One of the tragedies of my life is, um, has been um, the course of the nation, uh, the course of the, of the United States. It's, uh, it's, um, I've experienced it as a, uh, in retrospect, I would say, there were a sort of disbelief th through, through the, the Reagan years. Now, not really uh, being able to accept that this was what was happening. And, um, and, um, and so I'm, I'm um, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the Bush uh, administration, it simply became intolerable. It, and it became dangerous for me. I, I became obsessive and, uh, and, and filled with loathing. And, uh, and so I'm very grateful for the opportunity to escape the United States and, uh, at this time, um, and, um, and grateful to uh, this opportunity and to UBC and to Canada and the taxpayers of Canada who funded my professorship uh, to allow me to do this work. And I hope it's uh, proves of, uh, of interest and, 
to, to, to Canadians. Uh, you know, I realize I, I've, I've committed the, the original sin of autobiography in that, at least that feels that way now that I mentioned Mary's name, but I haven't really adequately cited those. Uh, I, I've cited the intellectual figures like Sartre and Wolf and, uh, and my Sorry, academic mentor. The, 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 I would cite Marilyn Doerr's uh, work in auto, an environmental autobiography as, the, as one example of, uh, of um, I don't know about success, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, someone who was able to figure out how, how to use the method in a way that made sense to her in her secondary school earth science class. And, um, that, that really has been so heartening to me to, 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 uh, to read Marilyn's, uh, Marilyn Doerr's work. Uh, I had an opportunity to meet Marilyn Doerr at Curriculum Pedagogy last year. Um, but to be truthful, um, I have a kind of, I don't know if it's obstinacy, but I, I do have a kind of studied resistance to, to, to trying to imagine how pe people make use of my work. I mean, I'm, I'm open to listening. And, there, and I've received many testimonies. I, I tend to also have a kind of resistance to, to taking them terribly seriously, not that I distrust, but, you know, one of the, one of the um, I mean, our field is also a casualty of consumer capitalism. I mean, pe people and ideas get commodified, and, and so I, I confess my primary experience of, of audience has been an experience of other people's positioning of me, my status in the field, and um, and so it's it, it it lacks a kind of authentic. Uh, I don't know what people think really. Oh, I, I feel pretty authentic all the time. Uh, n not that I'm, you know, capturing for all time what it is I feel, but at the moment I try to express at the moment what it is I'm I'm thinking and and feeling. Usually, thanks to others, scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> that helped me to say it, but um, no, the academic uh, world has been uh, really the contrary of the you know the popular perception of it is somehow artificial and and split off from life. I mean, I for me, I've been able to to live the problem that I've been trying to solve. So I know it's possible that that that, that uh, intellectual work is subjectively complicating and expanding and and uh, and fulfilling in, in a deep deep way. And um, so it's a, it's, it's a, a great gift. And curriculum studies for all of its, uh, its own sort of definitional problems and status problems. Uh, uh, Dwayne Hubner once told me after he had retired, you know, he left uh, TC to, to teach uh, in the Divinity School at Yale. He, he had actually always been split appointment. I, I hadn't realized he was half time at Union Theological Seminary, which is, you may know, is right across Broadway from, from the TC campus, uh, Teachers College campus. At any rate, he got so fed up with curriculum studies, in part, in, in mostly because of the, 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 uh, the election of Nixon and the back to the basics and the whole sort of right wing. Um, exploitation of education's political vulnerability, but but also because he found it so um, indeterminate and uh, and open ended, he felt it was a kind of it plagued his own identity that 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 no one knew what a curriculum theorist was when he told them. And uh, but I've always felt that as a great uh, opportunity um, and uh, and space of freedom, really. Um, so for me, it's been great great excitement and. I gladly pay the price of low status and uh, and definitional uh, indeterminacy. I'm I'm grateful to uh, the Paul Clore introduced me to this field. Although I think it was uh, I tried sometimes to imagine what Paul thought he was up to. He he he, he claims not to know he, what he was up to, but because this was a field in collapse in 1969, that the Schwab stuff just came out and uh, and and Clore knew. But, Clore, but the, the, the truth about Clore, though, is that he was, he was on a search th through his students to find a new field. So he was reading Pugliani, and he was, he was reading Alvin Gouldner, and he, was, and he would give this stuff to us, and he would be very excited about it, and he didn't know where, where it could go or what it had really to do with curriculum, at least in terms of the Tylerian protocol. But, um, um, so he, he gave me this sort of opportunity. Look, here's this world that was in collapse. Uh, it's my world. Um, don't save it for me, although that was in there somehow. What will you do with this? Uh, or can you do anything? And I suppose that recapitulated the problem of our family who would 
come to ruin in some way, and certainly the, from grandmother's point of view, it was incumbent upon us to try to rescue things. And um, not that I fantasize I've ever done that. I, I've created as many problems as I've uh, provided solutions. My critics make that quite clear. Uh, and I don't think uh, an academic field really is, is something that one person can sort of solve for, because it is a collectivity, and it's a very kind of complicated social political process as well as intellectual one. Um, and I've uh, and one of the gifts of curriculum studies, um, besides this uh, open, free space, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary space, but for me, pretty much uh, the humanities. Uh, with secondary of the arts, has been the remarkable people that I've met. I'm, Madeleine Grimet would, would figure pretty centrally for me. Um, I, I, yeah. Well, I, I really, she was mine uh, technically, but I was hers. Um, this is probably one of the most brilliant people I've, I've ever met. Um, she's a, certainly, I, uh, she, she's my superior, and, uh, and I, I gladly uh, uh, um, studied at her side. Uh, and um, um, and she honored me with uh, uh, an interest in this idea. Uh, it wasn't, uh, I mean, I think it was her idea as well, in the sense that she, she had wondered about this as a teacher, this problem of meaning, and she was interested in it. But uh, there was a generosity to her engagement in career, her willingness to use that term, and, and, uh, and for us to do that book together. Toward a Port Curriculum, which is going to be reissued um, this year, if she writes her preface, and uh, to the new edition. Um, and from her, I, I learned um, that uh, that teaching um, is a gendered process, and that um, and that um, rather than the kind of um, uh, latent authority, not so latent sometimes authoritarianism of the paternal pedagogical posture, there's this inventive, improvised sort of maternal um, process that, um, that she embodied. And I watched her do with our uh, teacher ed candidates at, at Rochester when she had them do miming and uh, yoga postures. She tried a lot of things to try to, to get them to think differently about what they were um, facing. It was published in 88, but, the, but the, the first essays come really in the late 70s, the contradiction idea that curriculum contradicts um, um, the previous generation's sense of what needed to be done um, and uh, psychologically uh, contradicts that the culture contradicts nature that men are trying to privilege mind over a matter the ideas over the body because they can't have children um, so that's early work you know, Madeline and I had um, uh, uh, weren't talking to each other much by the time that came out so there's some attention to Carreri in that, but uh, but she really had shifted um, to teaching and 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 decided to position it the, uh, that way. Um, we've become friends again uh, now that she's left the deanship, and uh, and Jeff and I flew over to spend Fourth of July with her, and uh, she's uh, kindly agreed to chair this commission that I um, that I uh, persuaded the membership of Triple ACS to. Um, to uh, establish, to study the state of curriculum studies in the United States. And I'm hoping that'll be her passage to another book uh, in some way, because she spent the last 15 years being dean and thinking about policy and the public and, and the state of things. And, uh, and so uh, um, this could be a way back to the autobiographical as well. Um, Peter Taubman uh, is, is important to, for me. He, he, um, He's the, he read Foucault. He was the first to read Foucault the, of anybody I knew, and so and he did his dissertation on the order of things. And uh, and um, and, he, and since he's been interested in Lacan, he hasn't written much, uh, but he's an extraordinarily brilliant guy. Um, Jenna Miller has been my buddy as well as my uh, uh, intellectual colleague for for many years. Uh, she really was my partner in crime with the establishment of uh, of what became known as Bergamo. Um, she was a grad student at Ohio State. She took her master's with me, and I wanted her to study with Bateman and, and Clore, and she, she agreed to do that, and she was grateful. I think she did that. And, and, uh, but we stayed in it. We talked daily, practically. 
so she, she's she's very close to me. So th th those those three, uh, but Patrick Slattery in recent years um, has been close, and Susan Edgerton, and um, uh, and this latest crop that I just tried to finish up before leaving Baton Rouge, uh, Nicholas Nangelfuk, who's a Canadian who studied with Britzman, uh, and uh, he came down to, to work with me, and uh, Brian Case Moore, a whole, a whole group of them there, um, um, uh, Eugenia Whitlock, who've been working on Southern studies, sort of autobiographical, uh, trying to think about sub subjective formation within the context of the South, and what are the special problems of the American South. And students have been important to me um, as teachers, I think. Um, some would complain I think that I don't do my job uh, because I want to be their student. Uh, I, I tell them things, of course. I I'm really can be quite overbearing. I'm not sure if anybody would say that, um, but I, I can. I, I mean, I, I I believe in what I think, and um, but I think I also give them space to resist and to contest and uh, and and pedagogically for me, what's key is for them to find their own way. Um, so, I don't, I'm not, I, I, if they try to be a disciple, they're gone. Uh, so they, they have to be, be, be stand up to me as an ind uh, independent person, or someone at least aspires to that status. I wouldn't claim to have it myself. Um, so, um, and for some that's unnerving, and I think it's been dysfunctional for some. I haven't known how much sort of structure to provide. You know, my inclination is what I, how I work is uh, listened and then suggest readings, and then we have lunch uh, in uh, next month, and I hear what they say about what they've been reading and what they're thinking, and I say things and maybe suggest additional readings, and so it's an ongoing conversation about what they're reading. But it's always I always prefer to have it in a a kind of informal setting when it's almost like a chat uh, because I think it diffuses some of the. The, uh, the, the the status differences between the professor and the student and and also puts it in a much more I would say human kind of uh, we're eating uh, and uh, and uh, embodied uh, setting um, so that's my preference I, I, I don't fancy doing that here it's too far a ride in but uh, uh, and I want to live differently here but um, I, I want to, um, I'm almost 60, and, um, and I, um, I want to, to, um, to live domestically a bit more. Oh, well, the work, the work, uh, yeah, the work. So, I mean, I'll, I plan to work a lot, but, um, but I'd like to be away from the institutional setting as much as the, they'll let me and, uh, and work on the book and the project, the internationalization project. That will take me in, of course. I'm interested in knowing people at DBC. They're extraordinary people at DBC, of course. But um, one of Jeff's gifts to me um, is that he has um, created a domestic space um, that that I hadn't have since since Dina. Really, men aren't particularly good at it, um, um, but he is. He's a homemaker. Um, and uh, and so he's enabled me to experience a different side of groundedness um, without relinquishing the other. You see how, how, how well, what a fine faculty spouse he is. That is, he, I mean, not only does he get along with people who come visit, but he, he, he's interested, he finds, he agrees these are interesting people. Well, he's my father in that respect. I mean, he's my father in many ways, but he's also my, my I hadn't thought of the grandmother connection, but he's also my mother. But he's, yeah, he's very cheerful. <laughs> I'm pretty dour, but uh, yeah, he's very cheerful in the morning. He's an upbeat guy. And you're right, he's, uh, he, he never um, relinquishes or, or even mutes his own point of view. I mean, he doesn't sort of, you know, aggressively advance it a bit. Whenever it's appropriate, he tells you about the garden and so on. So, and that's been very helpful. I'm always grateful to them for that because it takes me away from academe. I don't know how you two, see, I, I, my first, um, my first uh, male lover was a PhD student in history. And I, and I said, never again, even though it was a different field and I was very interested in learning what he was studying, but it was still, I couldn't escape. I need to, to have someone draw me into the world of plants or just someone, it's too consuming for me. 
because I've, I've experienced the choice of vocation and the, and the structuring of my life around vocation to be so meaningful. So I, at first I was kind of aghast that he didn't have that and insisted that he have that. And then he insisted that was a kind of racialized projection on my part. And if he wanted it, he'd get it, thanks, but back off. And uh, because I'm, I have all these possible, and I'm not sure, and, and you're supporting me, so well, think about it. And, uh, and so that's, uh, that's where he is now. I hope that continues to be a affirmative space for him and that it's not just avoiding something else. I, I don't know. I, I, one, Jeff is, is so other, and, and I mean, it's, it's a talk about the intimate other, that he's, uh, he requires me never to take for granted um, r much about our relationship and certainly almost nothing about him because he's always surprising. I, I, don't, I don't know him. Um, I mean, I do know him, but in another way, he's always, uh, yeah, and he, he shows me how to live because I'm radically other to him. And uh, it's been a remarkable experience. Yeah, I, I've been very fortunate to, to live with Jeff. People say, aren't you worrying that he'll, that he'll leave you? Or some gay friends will say that because he's so good looking and everybody's always hitting on him. And, uh, and I, I used to get jealous, but I, I, I'm at the point where if he leaves me, I still feel grateful. I, 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 we've had 10 years, and uh, so I've, just, I've been able to let that go. So. And it certainly undermines any tendency on my part to feel self-important, because in a, in a gay bar, I'm just an overweight, old white guy. Uh, and uh, so any, uh, any tendency to, to get self-important is constantly undermined by the gay life. I am grateful for that as well, even though it doesn't feel great. That's my son, yeah, that's Gabe, yeah. Yeah, he, he, he was a beautiful boy. We, we, we've had a, a troubled relationship. Uh, I, I, I suppose I made the mistake in the other direction. I, I, I didn't want to be my dad to him, so I was a little distant. And of course, it, that was enabled by the fact that after we split up, she moved to Berkeley. But, f but for several years when, um, what was the name of that airline? Um, flew $99 coast to coast, uh, People's Express, I think it was called. Uh, you could take your own food and they did the credit card thing. Uh, the at any rate, so I, I kept an apartment and a car out there and actually was able to go out once a week for a long time. So, but still, I, I would say emotionally I kept a distance and also I was always concerned about the, the, the gay thing, um, how that would play. And, uh, and in Berkeley it played fine, but when he came to live with me in Baton Rouge it was a nightmare. Um, it really was a nightmare and it was a terrible time for us. I mean, not only was his kind of fantasy of, of me as an ideal dad, you know, the one who flies in and takes him great places, right? The summer dad, right? Not only was that crushed, but then, um, then he was in this, you know, violently homophobic atmosphere, which really he succumbed to, I have to say. He was 14. Yeah, it's that age when you bond with your with your fellows, and they all were homophobic and horrified that he had a gay father, and accused him of being gay. And it was just a, a dreadful two years. David Duke was running for Senate, and and gave his uh, Jewish, and uh, and synagogues were being defiled. And uh, I have a lot of resentment uh, uh, toward Louisiana uh, as how it played in my relationship with Gabe, and and other ways that I felt has been a, a liability for me. Well, I became a high school teacher in 69 and became an assistant professor in 72. Yeah. Yeah. From, from being an irritant, it's become a, a very threatening reality, the, the, uh, the continuing movement to the right in, in the U.S. Um, I mean, it's really been the dominant fact. There, there have been others. Um, but to try to create, um, you know, an intellectually vibrant field that, that, that isn't um, sort of uh, obsessed with the hostile political environment is very difficult. Was very difficult. Is very difficult, and um, and it's very uh, I think undermining intellectually. Um, uh, not, not only not to have the support, but simply to have the you know indifference would be welcome. <laughs> but it's quite clear. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of Bush's first Secretary of Education is. Uh, has said that the ed schools are the problem with, that they had thought the teachers were the problem, but it's really the faculties of education that are the problem. I mean, it's just a, a, a diatribe that, that has the effect. And now, and now of course, uh, um, the only federal money that's available is for statistical, statistical uh, research. Qualitative is absolutely uh, unfundable. 
and that's created a kind of crisis uh, because universities, uh, right, your your wealth of, uh, insist on external funding, and uh, right, we we thought that 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 paradigm war was over, and uh, and that we had won in some way. <laughs> it appeared that we had won, but no, it's not. Yeah. No, I felt its way back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's that. I mean, that's, you know, many, many faculty are simply opportunists and, and do whatever, whatever is uh, expedient for them. And so there, there are plenty of folks that will jump on the Bush bandwagon, for sure. I saw, I saw that in, in the LSU faculty, even though they were always intimidated by me and, and quiet and behaved. But uh, there, was, there was a group, it was a special ed group that was, it was pretty... Uh, you could see the, the 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 glare and glint in their eye. They felt like history was on their side. They get and they were hardly could suppress their delight that I was leaving. <laughs> Let theory be gone. Yeah, and it's an illusion too, because you, you, you're, you're quite clear of what a mess you are. <laughs> yeah, Jeff and I acknowledge that all the time. That we're absolutely mad. <laughs>